Welcome back. I hope you found our last unit both challenging and rewarding. In the next few weeks, we'll look at societies and cultures whose history continues to shape our contemporary world, including the American, Chinese, African, and Islamic civilizations between the 16th and 19th centuries. To begin, we'll start with Europe, whose nation-states collectively achieved global supremacy during these years. Given the relative balance of world power prior to 1500, how did this come about? What specific changes brought about Europe's ascent? We'll examine these changes from four perspectives, religion, politics, economics, and science. From the standpoint of religion, which we'll talk about first, the direction is from unity toward fragmentation. In Western and Central Europe, the unity of religious belief was more than a thousand years old, dating from the conversion of Western Europe to Christianity toward the end of the Roman period. And until the 16th century, for the most part, Catholic Christianity was the dominant religion in Europe, with its capital in Rome. In the early 16th century, that unity was disrupted. The Protestant Reformation began with a German monk, Martin Luther, attacking the Catholic Church. Luther objected to Catholic theology and its practices, in particular the forgiving of sins for a monetary consideration, known as an indulgence. Basically, it was the practice of buying your way into heaven, or at least paying not to go to hell. Luther also objected to the notion that, in the Catholic sense, only a priest is capable of delivering the sacraments, a doctrine known as sacerdotalism. Instead, Luther advocated for the priesthood of all believers, thereby fundamentally shifting faith from an institutional locus, the Catholic Church, to the individual's faith in Christ. Another major change that Luther brought about was the translation of the Bible from Latin into German and later other commonly spoken languages. Prior to the Protestant Reformation, the language of the church was Latin, including the celebration of the Mass. Priests were educated in Latin and were widely held to alone be capable of interpreting Scripture. Eventually, the Bible was translated into all other major European languages, and coupled with the spread of the printing press, helped to liberate the Bible and its teachings from the monopoly of the Catholic priesthood. The Reformation had another consequence as well. It strengthened nascent national identities and fostered a sense of political independence. As a result, Protestant Europe began to develop independently from Catholic Europe. We should note that the Catholic Church did not suffer this gladly. It reorganized itself through the Council of Trent, a meeting of Catholic officials that met continuously between 1645 and 1563 to strengthen and renew the Church in response to the Protestant Reformation. The renewal efforts were perhaps best symbolized by the Society of Jesus. We know them as Jesuits, founded by a Spaniard, Ignatius Loyola. In fact, the Spanish role in the Counter-Reformation is quite substantial. In an earlier lecture, we spoke of Spain's amassing of wealth in the age of conquest, wealth that returns to Europe on ships laden with gold and silver and that helped finance the Catholic Reformation. For instance, the Spanish monarchy financed the religious war that Spain fought, called the Reconquista, to capture Iberia back from the Moors in 1492 and return Spain to Catholic rule after centuries of Muslim governance. Here's a map of Europe in 1560 organized by religion. You can get a sense of the geography of post-Reformation Europe with Catholicism concentrated in Southern Europe and in significant parts of the German-speaking world, particularly in Southern Germany, as well as in Eastern Europe, especially in Poland and Hungary. The Ottoman Empire is, of course, Muslim and extends well into Europe at this point. Calvinism is a form of Protestantism and appears in the Netherlands and in significant parts of France and Switzerland. Scotland is Calvinist. The fragmentation of the European religious world is quite evident in this map. And as you might expect, the fragmentation led to conflict. France, for example, is consumed toward the end of the 16th century with civil wars, which are, in effect, religious wars with political overtones. 
Spain was the aggressive Catholic power, drawing massive wealth out of its far-flung empire and using that wealth to finance the wars that Philip II of Spain undertook, including his disastrous attempt to attack England in 1588. Through royal marriages, the Spanish crown also held territory in Northern Europe, in what is now the Netherlands. There, Calvinist Protestants rebelled against Spain and fought a struggle for independence, which was successful by 1610. The Dutch Republic became one of the great commercial powers in the world by the end of the 17th century. Let's summarize all this in terms of the changes that religious fragmentation brought about in the 16th century. First, it created a new kind of politics. The divisions that emerge in post-Reformation Europe allow the formation of individual national states. Second, fragmentation led to competition, creating a dynamic in Europe that is quite unlike any we see in other Eurasian empires, including the Ottoman, Mughal, and Chinese empires, as you'll discover in the coming weeks. Up next, we'll look at how the emerging European nation-states govern themselves. Until then, best wishes.